Well, hello, everybody. How's it going? The local time is 1.44 p.m. Pacific time, mid-afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA, and we will begin our program at the top of the hour at 2 o'clock local time. Thank you for joining us. Are we functional? And hello? And where are you viewing from this afternoon slash evening? Lars is in Aloha, Oregon. Hello, Haley in Tacoma. Geologically speaking, Todd. Hello, 5x5 five five from Phil. Jackie's in the Dalles. Richmond, Virginia. Finland. Puyallup, Eugene, Oregon, Austin, Texas, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Skipping out of work to watch. Nice job, Jennifer. I think. Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Chelan, Washington. We are functional. Reaching the Netherlands. The Netherlands. She's in Sweden these days. Have been enjoying her programs. Judith in Leavenworth, Kansas. Ashley's in Portland. Rainy Seattle, Australia, hello, Dallas, Texas. Bijou, Bijou's napping right in there. <laughs> you might hear my voice, but he's inside for now. Boise, Idaho, Libby's in Bainbridge. Uh, we have plenty of Pacific Northwest people uh, mid-afternoon. Um, Seems like you're all doing fine. You're not uh, having trouble. I mean, uh, audio and visual wise, that's great to see. Blodgett, Oregon. Five by five, thank you, Price. UK, hello, Brian. Boston, Mass. The Chewakam Graben. Kelso, Washington. You know what? I'm barefoot, but my feet are cold. I need something on my feet. I'll be right back. Today's program is session E, E as in egg, and the title is Paleogeography. Huh? We'll get into it. And you are welcome to join us again Sunday morning. This is our schedule now, two live streams a week, Fridays at 2, Sundays at 9, and we'll be talking about strike slip faults. We're still setting the table, but these are the last two table setting sessions. Session E. Uh, yeah, some thank yous. I got three thank yous. Uh, one I've already done, but I want to do it again. Dareth sent a fruitcake, and the fruitcake will be our main analogy for the exotic terrain basement here in the Pacific Northwest. And so I have plans, I have plans to use this fruitcake at least Sunday, maybe more. I already showed you this, but uh, can't wait to uh, 
get into the fruitcake and I got a couple tricks up my sleeve for Sunday. So Dareth, thank you for the fruitcake from Collins Street Bakery in Corsicana, Texas, USA. You gotta love it. My second thank you is an audio daily double. I teach Geology 101 over at the university, you know that, and for about 10 years I've opened my classroom to the public and I've invited anybody in the area to come in and join us. And it's usually retired folks who are with us in addition to the paying customers and to the students. Now I can't do that this quarter because of the virus, but um, I don't know how many times I've done it, dozens of times. And so I've had plenty of older people sit in Sometimes just once, but sometimes they sit in for the whole class, and I call them townies. The townies are here. The people from town are coming in and sitting. And it works particularly beautifully if there's a you know, really elderly woman uh, sitting in the third row, and she's got some big offensive lineman on one side and some uh, kind of goth person on the other, and they get to know each other, and they're studying uh, for the exams together, and I just love, I love everything about that. I tell you this because my thank you today, verbally, is to a townie. Winter, just a few months ago, seems like five years ago, but just winter, just winter quarter, one of the townies was a guy named Steve. Steve never missed. He was in there the whole quarter. And I get to know the townies just like I get to know the regular students. And I haven't seen Steve since everything kind of shut down in mid-March. Well, I got done with you last time in the backyard here, and I just turned off the camera and started walking to the house, and there's Steve out watching our live stream on his phone. And Steve is a Wi-Fi expert. Steve is on call with all the hotels in the region. If there's wireless problems, he's the guy to solve the problem. So Steve said, I want to thank you for the class that you provided in winter. I want to provide my Wi-Fi expertise. So he's been over twice. He's loaned me a new modem. I was using a modem that was apparently more than five years old. And he got me on a different channel. Now, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but Steve got me on a different channel because he did his analysis and realized that I was competing with all the neighbors. All the neighbors are on the same two channels or something like that. So he moved me over to some channel that nobody's using. And so I suppose I'm jinxing it right now, but uh, I now know how to test my speed uh, using an app and uh, I'm like super strong. And I think I'm perky enough here with Steve's help. Steve, the townies, help. Thank you, by the way, Steve. Uh, I've already thanked you in person a million times, but I'm thanking you publicly as well. I think even out by the frogs, I got a way stronger system streaming whatever megabytes per second. Again, I don't know what I'm talking about. I think I can stream from over there. Like I've been, I've been, I got my butt up against the house basically doing these live streams because I don't want to be too far away from the modem, but Steve, I think, has solved my problems to the point where I don't have to be right next to the house. And I'm kind of in the shade right now. I'd like to be out in the sun. And um, so, I don't know. I, I've just jinxed it. We'll have major problems today, I assume. But just in case we don't, and in case Steve really has solved the problem or dramatically improved the problem, I think I want to do the live Q&A out there. I'm going to take you on Larry the Ladder after the Cozy Fort. We're going to use Cozy Fort today. After the Cozy Ford, I think I'm going to trial and see if we have, if we're functional way over there. And if we are, then I know I can be kind of out in the sun um, away from the house. That was a long-winded thank you, but thank you, Steve. Steve the townie and Do Cooper the dog, thank you so much. One more thank you. Oh, boy. Oh boy, this arrived in the mail today. The marvelous Mrs. Maisel box. <laughs> and this is from Lori. Lori, I don't know where you live, but 
Thank you for your generosity. Laurie sent uh, something to me and something to Bijou, the cat. This is what Laurie sent to me. Can you guess what it is? Cypress, hello, Frederick. This is a felt chalk blackboard duster eraser. Thank you, Lori, for the eraser for the chalkboard. And also, box actually addressed to Bijou Zentner. Always cracks me up when I see that. Uh, this is from Lori's cat Maggie. So Maggie the cat is sending gifts to Bijou the cat. These are fun to chew and kick on. This is the magic ingredient. Okay, so the fun to kick and chew on inside information from Maggie the cat. And of course they're filled with drugs. Catnip. So Maggie says, this is the magic ingredient. <laughs> oh yeah, this is the good stuff. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you, Maggie. Uh, we're about to uh, change Bijou's world. Okay, a couple more thank yous. Want to make sure we're doing okay. Of course, I'm all cocky now about the uh, quality of the technology. Judy says five by five. Frederick is in New Mexico. Todd is, says five by five. Great to see that. Cat is lying on my show that we have a cat update. Uh, hmm, uh -huh. Olympia, hello. Hello, Patrick, age seven. Patrick, age seven. Uh oh, Breeze is picking up. Hang on. <clears throat> Patrick, how's it going, man? Excellent picture and, 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 and uh, sound good. Elsie, Devon, UK. Pete from the Isle of Wight. Oh, great to see the Brits here. Thank you. Or Scots or whatever. Gracie, age 10. Good to see you back again. Royal Oak is from Bavaria. Karen's from Ontario. Oh, we got the Distant Lands people chiming in. It's Friday night there. They're half in the bag already. Sean, Canby, Oregon. I got a beer waiting over there for our uh, little uh, Q&A. Uh, Anne from... Uh, Norway, hello. Kathy from Australia. Brisbane, have a good one. Thomas in Germany, um, wonderful. Randy from North Carolina Exotics. Yes, I, I offended some who I, I said the East Coast was boring. Of course, I heard from many people. How dare you? I am offended, uppercase. I just, oh, I'm clutching my pearls right now. Surely get my pearls. I need to clutch them. Why do you have pearls, sir? Okay, I got two minutes. I'm very pleased that everything's working well. Robert from Sweden, hello. Uh, we have a, a mix of sun and clouds, and so the, the, the amount of light in the sky changes every few minutes. Um, it's one of those afternoons, but... Uh, we're dry, and so I think we're ready to go. Give me two minutes, would you please, to collect my thoughts, and we will begin talking about paleogeography 
Session egg. Well, a pleasant good afternoon to you from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. My name is Nick Zentner. I teach at the college here in town, and we are doing another session on exotic terrains here in the Pacific Northwest. Exotic terrains A to Z. Where are we? We're in session E, and session F is coming on Sunday morning. This is our weekly schedule now, so session E is the egg session talking about paleogeography. And let's say you're an impatient person. Let's say you're thinking like, this is wasted effort. I think this guy's stalling. I don't think this guy's ever going to talk about terrains. He keeps, he keeps stalling and doing sessions that aren't talking directly about the terrains. Well, this is a teaching choice. I have plenty of weaknesses, but I have some strengths. And one of my strengths is knowing how to package complicated material in installments. And this is uh, E and F that are still setting the table for our exotic terrain discussion. So if you are the impatient person waiting with bated breath to talk about the details of Mount Stewart and the Blue Mountains in Oregon and the Sierra Nevada foothills and the North Cascades National Park and the Cache Creek terrain and the Alexander terrain up in Alaska, it's coming. But these six table setting sessions in my opinion, are very important. And I hope that you'll see why both today and Sunday morning. Okay, so two more table settings and then we're ready to go. Well, wait a minute, table settings. What does that mean? What have we done so far? What are we trying to do today? Well, let's start with what we're trying to do today. <coughs> it's a three act play again this afternoon. Uh, act one is revisiting the passive margin. I have some lingering thoughts. I have a few new thoughts involving the dates that are here. And I just want to make sure we're feeling comfortable about the passive margin discussion before we break new ground. Session two, restoring the coastline of North America. That makes no sense to you, you say. Well, we'll get into it. And global position, question mark. So number two and number three are really the guts of what we want to do today. And we're going to involve the chalkboard just a little bit. We're going to involve Christopher Scotese's YouTube channel in the Cozy Fort. Yes, we're going full Cozy Fort today. Uh, some Jenda Johnson animations. Um, and so I think that you'll see what we're doing once we go to the timeline. He goes to the timeline.
If you're sick of me doing this, tough. I'm going to keep coming back to it. This is our magic window, and we've been avoiding the magic window these first sessions because I think it's important for us to get established what's going on before the magic window. And today, first main message, today we're actually talking about younger than the magic window. Things that have happened up here in the last 50 million years of time that we need to undo. Actually, that's both this and Sunday morning sessions. If you're looking for a theme this weekend, it's what has happened since the terrains arrived, which is where we'll be the rest of the fall, might add. What's been going on since the terrains arrived that has complicated the picture? And so far, you know that there's been lavas that have buried the exotic terrain bedrock, otherwise known as the fruitcake uh, bedrock. But there's other things that have happened in the most recent 50 million years of time, the tertiary and even the quaternary, that we need to address today. That's why we're restoring the coastline to what it used to be. And then we're going to look back over here to where North America was before the terrains arrived globally. So it's a bit awkward, possibly, that we're, we're kind of either up here or down here. I'll do my best to keep get, have, uh, give you a heads up on whether we're younger or older than the magic window. But this weekend, the last of the two table setting sessions, we're, we're still staying away, but we will be diving in to the fruitcake, the exotic terrain details, starting next week. Okay. So you can see this, I'll give you a little bit more view, but I don't think you need a ton more. Here's Washington, Oregon, et cetera. And here is a kind of a crazy swing, like a railroad track here, right? These two white lines. We're gonna realize next week that there's good exotic terrain bedrock within this railroad track. And what I want to address before talking about the details next week of what's within those two white lines is the fact that this is exotic terrain material. This is the passive margin or the coastline of North America from last session. And what's with the crazy swing? Was this coastline really a crazy swing like this during the magic window time when the terrains came in? The answer is no. So let's pause for dramatic effect. That coastline, that passive margin, needs to be restored, needs to be returned to its original look. And we're doing that in Act 2. In fact, this is an old map from I shared this with you before, but this is a text that I had from grad school days 35 years ago, The Evolution of North America by Philip King, UCLA geology professor. Beautiful hand-drawn diagrams. I'll continue to use his. But I took one of Philip's sketches and I just colored it with my green colored pencil. And let me pause and just give you a chance to look. This is the crazy swing that I have on the chalkboard. And so there's some correlations between these exotic terrains, North Cascades, Hell's Canyon, Blue Mountains, Klamath Mountains, and then continuing south. You've already heard one of the main messages. This is not what the coastline looked like um, hundreds of millions of years ago. And it took me a while to remember how I did this in the past, so I literally watched this lecture, which I gave a few years ago, downtown Ellensburg, and I want, needed to remind myself of what I wanted to do on the chalkboard. So I'm duplicating that, essentially, today. So we're going to restore the, the coastline in just a second. Okay, I hope that you see the game plan for today. So the, the, the three-act play, passive margin, Restore the coastline, global positioning. Before we get to this, let's go back to last session, session D as in dog, and uh, revisit a couple of concepts and add a couple of new things. I think it's important to do that. Plus, I don't know about you, I think we all have different ways of kind of making things work for our brains. But for me, it doesn't really stick. 
until I draw it out. And it really sticks if I even take my colored pencils out and I kind of, you know, make a little map for myself. So here's something that we've used before, but I've added a couple of things. So the strontium 706 line we have discussed, that's the edge of the basement rock, the old, older than uh, 1.8 billion year old metamorphic material. But draped on top of that is the passive margin that we discussed last time. And starting a week from this afternoon, we will be in the exotic terrain fruitcake bedrock and we won't leave. We will not leave. We'll be in there the rest of the fall. But we're still kind of dancing and setting the stage just a little bit. Now notice I put a couple cities here. Boise is a nice location to get us at the edge of the passive margin, to get at, the, at this old coastline. And for me, this is a brand new thought. Kettle Falls, Washington. I've only been through Kettle Falls a couple times, but Kettle Falls, Washington is going to be a landmark for us to be at the edge of the passive margin. And you're like, okay, I can't even remember what the hell a passive margin is. Sorry, Patrick. So let's revisit that because I think it's important. This was our established passive margin from last time. Do you recall? The belt supergroup is not really the passive margin. There's some fuzziness that still is fuzzy to me. But I really want to focus on these dates, these sedimentary layers that are draped casually and eventually get thicker and thicker off the edge of the old basement rock, deposited between 750, and this is a new date for us, 390 million years ago. So we looked at the passive margin. Do you remember Sharon from Colville sending those rocks? Sharon sent the Addy Quartzite, which is Cambrian, that's part of the passive margin. She sent the Stensgar Dolomite, which is a marble, which used to be a limestone, from the passive margin. Sharon sends some Metalene Formation limestone and shale that actually had trilobites within them, if you recall. Sharon sent the Huckleberry Greenstone, which is actually originally basalt that shows when what? When Australia started to rift away from North America and begin our passive margin sequence. So 750 was one of the big dates from last time, which was the beginning of the rift. The beginning of Australia rifting away from the west coast of North America and creating open ocean at Spokane, Washington, and it's been an open ocean essentially during this entire span. Okay, you're like, okay, I, I know all that. You did this last time. I'm leading towards something. This was from last time. It's not just Washington or Idaho, even down between the Grand Canyon in Arizona and uh, the Inyo Range uh, near Death Valley in Owens Valley, California there's this dramatically thickening package, th tens of thousands of feet thick, by the way, of passive margin sediments. For 20 years, I taught a field course out of Bishop, California with Central students. I never really had this in my mind. We were working with the Polita Formation and the Harkless Formation. I never really put that into a regional picture like I have with you guys. So you remember, this is for you, for sure, these live streams, but just as much, maybe more, just for me. There's just such relief to put some of these fragments of ideas together for myself for a bunch of reasons. So the coastline is here. I think we've got it now. But it's problematic. And this is going back to, lot, to session two, B as in boy. We've got so much basaltic cover. These are the flood basalts of just 15, 15, 16 million years old. Very, very young. But you can see that our important boundary between passive margin and exotic terrain is the exposures are few and far between. And you're like, well, that doesn't, that, you can get all sorts of exotic. Well, no, no, this is just the basalts. There's cascade lavas and glacial till and all sorts of other things. But I, I'm hoping to kind of combine last lesson with some of these other things we did earlier to help us make this all come together.
Last passive margin message, and this is my favorite. Again, drawing maps for myself, really just kind of looking at three or four favorite maps and then kind of making my own single map with my own little color scheme works. I like brown for passive margin, especially since Rob Thomas had so much brown in his brand new Roadside Geology of Montana book for the belt. So belt and the passive margin stuff, let's make it nice and brown. I never made this connection till last night. And I'm excited by it. Maybe I'll be the only one excited by it. But now we have the, the broad picture of the passive margin boundary with the exotic terrains. Look at the scale of this first of all. This is just Washington, Idaho, Montana, and British Columbia. The red line is the edge of the passive margin, which essentially is our strontium 706. Not quite, but good enough. The edge of old North America. So what am I excited by? In Washington, I certainly knew that the Columbia River is coming out of Canada. And here's the Columbia River then coming towards Chelan, working its way around the Columbia River basalts. That's not new. But what is new to me, and Marley's Roadside Geology Book of Washington helped me see it. I think it was more Daryl than Marley writing this section. This stretch of the Columbia River coming right through Kettle Falls is the passive margin, is the edge, is an important boundary. Exotic terrains to the west of the Columbia, passive margin to the east. I never had that in my head until now. Is it true down here? No, it's just this stretch from just south of Nelson, BC, to whatever this is. I think it's Lincoln, Washington, a little dinky town where the Columbia River starts to kick west. But to me, that's helpful, and I'm, I'm dwelling on this because, why not, I'll tell you. Next week, we're going to bring in our first terrains. And our terrains are going to come in and add to this boundary. So we're going to be right back to this area uh, at least in Washington, maybe up in B.C., I'm not sure. By the way, did you know, I think some of you know this, maybe not everybody, that the Columbia actually flows north in B.C. for quite a few miles? North up through uh, uh, Radium Hot Springs and Golden, one of my favorite towns in B.C., and then loops around and then comes down and, and heads to the, uh, the States. That's so cool. But the fact that this stretch of the river is actually following, or is it a coincidence or not? That that stretch of the Columbia is actually straddling the boundary between this stuff, which of course is coming in in the last 200 million years, versus the old passive margin. And maybe you can see why I didn't really have that in my head until recently. A complicated map like this doesn't allow us easily to see the blues, which is the passive margin sitting on top of old North America. And then some of these colors, not all, but just some of these colors are going to be our exotic terrain material. Okay, that's enough. That's a slow build. Today is a slow build. Okay. The rest of our session is scheduled we're to act two now. And, you know, the, the title of these talks are purposely bland. They're bland because I want them to be short enough to fit on my cute little chalkboard. Did you notice I have my little chalkboard I use as a little uh, template for these live streams? So I want just to be one or two words so I can fit on the chalkboard. And two, I never really know exactly what I'm going to do. So they're bland because I... I'm not really sure what I'm going to end up teaching. So paleogeography could mean about anything. Well, here's actually paleogeography, restoring the geography of the coastline to before the terrains arrived. So trying to get that coastline restored to pre-200 million years ago. And then where was North America exactly on the planet? During passive margin time? as we start bringing terrains in. And by the way, what is significant, I'll give you a little teaser for next week, next Friday. 
why 390? Why doesn't the passive margin go all the way to 200 million years ago? Well, this is new for me. I was reading a little bit. I was reading ahead just a little bit. And apparently there's some volcanic rocks that indicate from this age that indicate that our passive margin is no longer passive starting 390 million years ago. I don't know why. I'll see if I can figure out in the next week. But our passive story is here and we're going to try to restore the coastline. So, for the next little bit, for, for Act B 2, of, I've got, I've got letters, i got numbers, i got eggs, i got a lot of stuff to keep track of. We're leaving the passive margin for a bit. We're bringing all the terrains in. And we're adding all the terrain material, all the fruit, fruitcake bedrock on this chalkboard. And so now we're going to what has happened in the last 50 million years that we need to undo if we're going to really say something meaningful about where and when these terrains are coming in. Can we explain this crazy swing? We can. There's two main reasons that this band of exotic terrain material does not head straight. Ah, heck, let's just do it. Starting next week, we're going to see some connections. We're going to see some exotic terrain material that seems to be the same kind of stuff all the way through this white zone. And all I'm saying today is that this white zone was not squirrely like this. We want to visualize more of a straight exotic terrain belt. Why? Here are the two reasons. Do you know the answer? Why is it squirrely like this? And why did the coastline 200 million years ago, or even 50 million years ago, look more like this? I'll give it to you verbally. Basin and range extension and clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest. Those are the two reasons. They kind of work together. It's actually one reason, but we'll, we'll break it into two. Have you heard of the basin and range? It's here in Nevada and the western half of Utah and just a tiny amount of Northern California and a tiny amount of Oregon. What's going on in the basin and range? Crustal extension is the answer. The crust is actively stretching. How do we know? Another diagram from King's wonderful book. I actually hinted at this last time. We see that there's a lot of belt supergroups sitting on top of the craton, and of course these black blotches are where the craton has actually come to the surface in the Rockies. But then there's all these black blotches that are just so scattered. Like, why, why don't we have a more coherent look of the outcrop? Why is it so scattered like that? And, I'll add to it, when we look at a map from King's book, and again, I use my colored pencils, what is brown? I'll wait. What's brown? What's brown going to be the rest of the fall? The brown colored pencil, what's it going to indicate? Delay in the comments. Oh, God. No, brown is not exotic terrain. Am I losing us? Passive margin, Lorraine. Correct. Belt, correct. Yes. Oh, I thought that was going to be easier. Let's go back. You're like, who cares about the colors? Well, I think I care about the colors because 
one of, one of the many challenges with our exotic terrains is that every map has a different color scheme. And you're like, oh, can Canelia, okay, is green. Oh, no, Canelia is pink. Oh, Canelia is, like, why can't these maps all look the same? So one thing I'm going to try to do, I don't know if I'm going to be successful, is to build our little color scheme and stick with those colors. I think I'm going to just keep making maps for us and for myself with the right color. So I, let, it be, let it be said. Let it be announced. For, I'll shout from the mountaintops. We're going to use brown. We're going to use brown for the passive margin sediments. We're going to use brown including the belt. All of those sedimentary rocks that are sitting on and on the edge of North America's craton is going to be brown from this point forward. Now, I'm going to have many different colors for exotic terrains because we'll have lots of different stuff. So don't memorize the green yet, please. But brown was meant to be sediments deposited on top and on the margin in a passive margin. Remember the wheelbarrows dumping a bunch of stuff offshore? So when we look back at a map of Nevada, Utah, there's three colors I've chosen. What's the brown? Passive margin. The edge of old North America is here. Fine. Up until 390 million years ago. Fine. That's the edge coming right down through a portion of Nevada. What's the green? Green so far is just exotic terrain. Again, we'll, cut, we'll come up with different stories. But what's the main purpose of this map? Is to show you how chopped up Nevada and western Utah are. Yellow is dirt. Yellow is very young sediment that's covering up the brown or the green. And you're like, what? I don't get it. Why, why does the basin and range, that's what we're looking at, why does the basin and range have all these yellow patches? And that's where King can help us out. And Stan Chernikov can help us out. What's the question again? Why isn't this just all brown here and all green here, like we had on other maps? Why do we have all this yellow? The yellow is very young sediment. And so you can see that each brown, some people have described the basin range as a bunch of brown caterpillars marching north. Each of the brown is a mountain range. Each of the yellow is a valley called the basin and range when you cross nevada you go have you done have you driven across nevada it's very lonely whether you're on i-80 or you're on some of those other u.s highways where you're going north south through one basin for like a day and a half there's nobody out there man it's, it's a unique part of north america but the point is the valleys are yellow the basins are yellow the ranges are brown but it's brown passive margin bedrock all through much of Nevada and western Utah. It's just been chopped up more recently. And you're like, are we on a tangent? What are you doing? I thought we were doing this. Well, we are. Because if you go like this or like this, these are normal faults. And normal faults indicate crustal extension. The rain has begun. It can all handle a few raindrops, he says to himself. Let's not lose our train of thought. This is from Stan Chernikov's book. This is the textbook I used for many, many years in my Geology 101 class, written by Stan Chernikov, who was a longtime geology instructor at the University of Washington. I've sh I shared this this spring. And my favorite part of Stan's book are things that were not done by Stan, but by his artist's collaborator. And you know what? I don't think I shared that guy's name before. And I heard from a few of you saying, you know Ramesh. But I'd like to get in contact with this guy. His work is amazing. And I don't know if he has a collection of geology illustrations uh, that continues. But this is one of Ramesh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, this is one of Ramesh's, uh, you know, there's hundreds of these kinds of like watercolor type sketches 
uh, in the book, but it shows beautifully the basin and range province. And the main thing I'm going to is that we are stretching the crust. And do you see why I'm taking the time to discuss this today? This is crustal stretching that's happened in the last 30 million years. 30. The basin and range extension began 30 million years ago and continues to today. And it's not just a little bit of stretching. This amount of basin and range extension has doubled the width has doubled the distance between the Sierra Nevadas in California and the Wasatch Mountains, let's say, in, in Salt Lake City. This is a part of North America in the last 30 million years that has doubled in width. The distance, the driving distance between Reno and Salt Lake has doubled because of this crustal extension. Look at how thin the crust is there. And yes, if this continues at the rate it has been, this will eventually become an ocean basin, but let's not get, let's get, not, let's not get sidetracked. This is the concept we want for the last 30 million years, and what's the payoff? The payoff is that if we undo that extension, if we close the accordion and go back even 30, just 30 million years, this exact terrain material is further east. So I'll say it a different way in case you don't see it. This passive margin coastline used to look like this. And in the last 30 million years, this portion of that coastline has been sent west because of the basin and range extension. And if you want to talk about why the basin and range extension happened, that's really off the track of what we're trying to do here. We might talk about a little bit uh, over there if we're still functional, but that's an important message. Okay, if this was a real classroom and you were all sitting here with me, I'd pause and say, who's got questions? And we go back and forth. Can't do that here. But we do have normal faults. If we go back to Philip King's sketch, each of these basins has one major normal fault, one normal fault per basin. And what you're looking at here then, if you've got good eyes, you can see some of these black lines are heavy. They're heavier. And each of those fat black lines is a normal fault. So I've got wooden blocks. the first of our fault basics uh, discussion. We'll do more fault basics Sunday, and this will help us get ready for our exotic terrain feast beginning a week from today. Uh, some of you have seen me do this before. These are two blocks of crust. This is the hanging wall. This is the foot wall. These are mining terms. Usually we have miners drilling tunnels on a fault zone because there's a lot of goodies to extract out of the earth. So they hang their lantern in the hanging wall. They are standing on the foot wall. Hanging wall is the block of crust above the fault. Foot wall is the block of crust below the fault. Well, we're talking about normal faults today. We're talking about every valley has one normal fault on one side of the basin and not a major normal fault on the other side of the basin. Well, what do the normal faults tell us? Well, normal faults exist because of crustal extension, and if we extend the crust or pull the crust apart, like I'm doing with my hands, gravity is going to pull this hanging wall down. And to be honest, I'll be more accurate now. There's kind of a rotation. These normal faults are, are listric. They have a bit of an angle to them at their base. So what we're looking at my nose is now Patrick, Evelyn, Gracie, my nose is now sitting in the bottom of the basin. Mm. Okay? Nose in the basin. And these blocks are pulling apart. We're rotating the blocks pretty much like big old dominoes that are tipping over three at a time. You'll see some animations from Agenda Johnson in just a second. 
But that's one of our main messages for today. To restore our old coastline, we need to get rid, we need to get rid of the basin and range extension. It's too young. I'll say it finally one more way and then we'll move on. None of these basins and ranges existed during the time that we were receiving terrains. None of the basins and ranges existed. The crust was thick in Nevada during this time. It's only here in the last 30 million years that the crust has begun thinning and continues to thin. Okay, I've hit that pretty hard. Now related to that idea is clockwise rotation. So in addition to arrows like this, there's also arrows like this, which is a concept that audiences love. They love the clockwise rotation. Now let me slow down, even though we got a few raindrops on this. And this is one of my favorite diagrams from Marley Miller's Roadside of Oregon book, Roadside Geology of Oregon. I didn't bring it out, but you've seen it. I love this page in the Roadside Geology of Oregon book by Marley Miller. Second edition, came out 2014 maybe. I'll just pause and give you a second here. So we're leading to the other major point of restoring the coastline. Here's the Mesozoic, that's in our magic window time. Here's only 20 million years ago and here's today. Look at what she's doing. She's showing us Oregon. This is Oregon that we know today. This is Oregon with the blue mountains in the upper right and the Klamath in the lower left. Blue Mountains, Klamath Mountains. They have similar exotic terrain material within them. And today's arrangement of Oregon, it's like, okay, I guess. But what she's doing is removing the basin and range, and she's removing the clockwise rotation. And look at the arrangement of the blues and the Klamaths if we go back to the Mesozoic time. And this is ultimately what I'm trying to do. Can I do this? Here's the Blue Mountains. I'll do it this way. And here's the Klamaths. Now where are the Blues and the Klamaths going to be in our diagram today? Here are the blues. Here are the clamus. We're restoring the coastline. We're undoing the basin and range extension, and we are also removing substantial clockwise rotation, which is really part of the basin and range extension, plus some influence by the two ocean plates that have been doing their thing offshore. Let's assume you've never heard of the clockwise rotation. I guess I gotta go get the, the magic board. Hang on just a sec. I guess I can still talk. So this is a board that has been deeply satisfying to use. It was created by Robert Butler at the University of Portland. Jenda Johnson made an animation that we'll see in a second. And we can see the basin and range and these blocks, the Northern California block, the Western Oregon block, and the Western Washington block. Veterans of the live streams are sick of this. They've seen this I don't know how many times. But it's important. And so the concept of clockwise rotation, which has also been happening in the last 50 million years, it's not happening during terrain time, it's happening after the terrains are here, is this. 
It was uh, proven geologically a generation and two generations ago, this business of clockwise rotation of the western portions of these states, and confirmed in the last 10 years by GPS measurements instruments anchored into the bedrock that show us with precise measurements that this really is a thing and the basin and range is opening behind that what are we doing today we're getting rid of it we're restoring we're getting rid of the clockwise rotation and we're closing up the accordion to get our coastline back to the way that it was when the terrains were coming in okay it's 240 I have one more act with me. This will go quickly, I think, and then we'll go in the cozy fort. Hope we're doing okay. One bit of housekeeping. Uh, the base, you know, the craton session, session C, uh, many of you really liked uh, these maps. Remember these? showing the earliest days of the craton and then the craton that had younger material added on. Uh, I saw a lot of comments, a lot of discussion about these two. So this is from, I think I correctly identified Keith uh, during that session, but he's got a number of geology books that are framed around some kind of human history. And uh, he's a wonderful author, if you don't know Keith Meldahl's books. Again, this is kind of the textbook for the class by Marley Miller and Daryl Cowan, and we'll start going deeply into this book starting next week. But to get to the final act of our little performance before we go in the cozy fort, a, a quick shout out to Robert Dott, uh, who passed away a few years ago, and Bob was my historical geology professor at the University of Wisconsin back in the early 1980s a very big name and this book was used probably worldwide but definitely in North America in most uh, historical geology classes, Dot and Batten, very very famous book and Bob was a very gentle person and took special time to uh, work with some of us new geology students in the mid 80s. We went out on Saturdays uh, we'd get the van and go pick him up at his house and away we'd go he'd have his little cheese sandwiches and I still remember one trip. It's, it's weird what you remember. I remember Bob Dot stopping at the last stop. We were looking at the St. Peter sandstone, and we stopped in at this farm. It was October, beautiful bluebird day, golden colors of leaves and everything. And he stopped and, and bought a fresh apple for each of us. And we all sat there in this cornfield eating these beautiful, crisp, juicy red apples. Makes me emotional just thinking about it. So this guy was very, very well known, and yet he had a human touch. And uh, uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to give you a sense of why his book was so famous. Each chapter was a different period within the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. Here are the trilobites we saw in Sharon's uh, metamorph uh, in his in Sharon's shale that turned to slate. And then what we're leading to is. This is back in the mid 80s now, even the early 70s when he first put this book out. He had paleogeography maps of North America at each period, at each time. And occasionally he'd, he'd even say something like this, which is possible equator. So this is before YouTube, this is before Christopher Scotese, but I remember seeing these. This is the book that I had. I remember seeing these and kind of going, wow, North America's at the equator? weird. And here's his passive margin discussion that we discussed last time. So thank you, Bob Dot. I'm not the only one saying thank you, Bob Dot. So shortly, we're going to be bringing in terrains and adding them on to the edge of North America. And this last little paleo geography session is really asking the question, was it a north-south coastline? Like all the maps show this, but were we really 
at 47 degrees north latitude? And was this coastline perfectly north-south 500 million years ago? And the answer is no. We already got a taste of that last time, but we're going to do a little bit more of it right now. So I showed you this one, global now. This is not an idea now. This is confirmed. I mean, DOT was doing it 50 years ago, 60 years ago, and, and there's been a lot of work done since to come up with very accurate paleogeographic maps of the globe. We know exactly where each continent was at different intervals in time. There's no guesses to this. There's fossil content, there's paleomeg content, there's a bunch of evidence I can't even describe right now. I don't know all of it. But this is no longer an idea. This is a for sure. So these maps, you can hang your hat on. This is accurate as far as where these continents are and where the equator was. And here's our coastline where we start pulling Australia away from North America. Now, on our map, we have it like this, of course, but this is almost too much for us to visualize. I almost hesitate doing this section with you because there's going to be so much mental gymnastic stuff about the terrains coming in and what kind of rock it is and what's the age and what's the age of accretion. And it's almost like we have to do this to give ourselves a break. But I think it's worth addressing that the latitude, the longitude, and even the orientation of the continent was different. So a taste of that is here. Uh, Blakely, Ronald Blakely, I think, Ron Blakely, uh, has beautiful maps like this. Former dot student, I might add. Deeptime or something, dot com. I should have looked that up. So here's North America, 550 million years ago, during our passive margin time, when the trilobites are crawling up onto Sharon's backyard. Here's the equator. Here's all of North America in the southern hemisphere. But this is the only way we can make sense of it, right? Montana, Alberta. And of course, there is no Washington and Oregon. And Denise is saying no Great Lakes. That's right. The Great Lakes are less than 20,000 years old. And I forget. Yeah. So these maps by Blakely not only show us the position of the continents. Here's at 485 million years ago. North America again. But notice that we have more of North America submerged under a shallow sea. So some of you are parts of the continent where your main geology is from this time when most of North America was submerged. Sea level was higher. Topography was modest. And of course, there's times later in the Paleozoic where most of North America is underwater. There's just a little bit of shallow water. How do we know that? Well, you can follow limestone layer sand. That was Bob Dot's specialty. So I'm just trying to give us the sense, although I don't think I'll keep following up on this, because again, it's too much, for our, too much for my brain, probably yours too, too, that this is the actual arrangement of the planet, latitude-wise, but North America is going to make more sense to us if we turn it like this. Now, this is going to be more effective with the cozy fort coming in less than five minutes, but I can't hold it. A little bit younger than 400 million years ago, again we have North America. Oh man, we got terrains that far back in time? I don't know anything about the Arctic terrains. And I don't know how, if we'll emphasize them much, because you know that our focal point will be the North Cascades of northern Washington, and then we'll branch out from there to help us understand Washington's terrains. But this is a story, for sure, if we go back far enough in time. So those of you who have already kind of reached me and said, I disagree. You're going to talk about exotic terrains? I, sir, I respectfully disagree with the way you've set it up. There are exotic terrains that are older than 200. And there's even some exotic terrain material that's been translated on strike slip faults, sir. Younger. I got it. I got it. But our focus is North Cascades. 
in this time window makes most sense. None of the exotic terrains of the North Cascades in Washington were here 200 million years ago, and none of them are coming in anymore by 50. So let's use the youngest of the terrains. That's why we have our magic window. So a little taste, and why not? Another little taste, 400 million years ago. That thing's going to end up in Washington. Just a little taste. I don't know much of the story yet. But if you've heard of the Yellow Aster Complex up by Bellingham and Mount Baker, there you go. All right. I got to give you a little taste, don't I? Maybe you'll stop joining us if I, if I keep uh, setting the table. Like, have they texted? Are they coming yet? Are the terrains here yet? Okay. Cozy Fort. Many of you were not with us in the spring. You didn't get the whole story on why it's called the Cozy Fort or what am I doing with this stuff. I don't think I'll give you the whole story, but the basic message is I like sharing things on my laptop. It took probably a month worth of trial and error before a viewer named Steve from Cedro Woolley came up with this contraption that is anchored onto Larry the Ladder. And I experiment with different kinds of cloth. And I usually sweat when we're inside of the cozy. Actually, I've never been inside the cozy fort with a microphone before. That'll be interesting. Never thought of that till right now. And uh, I like the cozy fort. So, of course, there's many that say, this is ridiculous. You need OBS or whatever it's called and something else and some split screen. I know. I know. Uh, I like to do things my way. <laughs> I also think there's a certain charm to be in here with you. Bob's buffering. Are you all buffering? All right. Hitting the, turning the volume off of our program. And I would like to start with some short animations to show basin and range extension by Jenda Johnson. Good, most of you are fine. I think this one's silent. It's just putting the concept of normal faults, and I mentioned the concept of uh, dominoes Tipping over, maybe you can see what I mean now. The animations are worth a million words. But we're in Nevada and western Utah, and we are stretching the crust, making the basin and range pattern short and sweet. I got a bunch of short and sweet ones here, all queued up. I think this is Jenda narrating. The Basin and Range Province is a broad region of parallel north-south oriented valleys known as basins and surrounding mountain ranges. Can I get that louder? The province was created as this area of the North American Plate was stretched, fractured, and broken into hundreds of mountain blocks. I can't get it louder. Let's watch a hypothetical block undergo early rifting. But I, I got my microphone here, so maybe that'll help. The wind's picking up, some stuff's blowing out there. I don't care. The Basin and Range Province is a broad region of parallel north-south oriented valleys known as basins surrounding mountain ranges. The province was created as this area of the North American plate was stretched, fractured, and broken into hundreds of mountain blocks. Let's watch a hypothetical block undergo early rifting. Both sides of the area under tension pull apart evenly. Hot material from the asthenosphere migrates upward, causing the land surface to rise and break along the lines, basins, and ranges. Heat from the asthenosphere warms the upper mantle and lower crust, facilitating ductile deformation, thus allowing this lower part of the plate to stretch and pull thinner like talcum. The buoyancy of the warm material, in concert with the thinning of the plate, contribute to continued upward movement, creating fault-bound valleys and upfaulted mountain ranges. This is considered by some to represent early onset of rifting. 
MK, I'm getting some comments from you. You can't hear. That was that was low audio wise, but I'll I'll improve. Thank you for your feedback. I, I think I'll just turn the sound off of these for now. I'll practice getting audio better. Let's not get preoccupied with that. This is uh, Jenda's masterpiece, and I only want to show a couple parts of it. The first part, I turn the volume off, I'll just narrate. The first part is she, in animation form, restores the coat. She gets rid of the basin and range in the clockwise rotation. It's beautifully done. And then I'll skip ahead to the last part. I can't remember why, but we're going to skip ahead to the last part. So the purpose of this video is nothing to do with today. It's, it's talking about young volcanism. But what she's going to do here after setting it up is restore, keep your eye on Nevada and western Utah. Again, she's focused on volcanoes. We don't care. But she's going to bring a timeline in in just a second, and she's going to, there's the basin and range. Here we go. Present day, let's go back. Oh, look at that. Look at that. She's doing animation-wise what I was trying to do on the chalkboard. And she's only, she's only going back 55 million years ago. God, that was exciting. I want to do that again. Just for me, I want to do it again. I got to give you a little heads up. We'll eventually talk about Baja BC. And you can't really do Baja BC with California sticking out in the ocean that far. But you can do Baja BC if you get California back to where it was further east. Hope that makes sense to some of you. Now, why did I think we should? Oh, yeah. So she's got a creative way to show the clockwise rotation in the last 15 million years. She's got these sprockets. Ignore all the colors and all the lavas, but I just want you to see her. Here's our clockwise rotation, which I hope you can see is needs to be undone if we need to go back to exotic terrain time. She is a master. Jenda Johnson. What's the, uh, and, you're, and you, you're late to the party, you've never heard of her before. You want a good YouTube channel? Iris Earthquake Science. Do yourself a favor and subscribe to that. Iris Earthquake Science YouTube channel. Okay, I do need audio for this, and maybe the audio is a little stronger than the agenda stuff. If not, I don't know how to help you. But we're switching. We're going to look at three Christopher Scotese uh, animations, paleogeographic animations. And again, this is his YouTube channel. Can you see it right here? That's his name. That's how to spell his last name. You'll not regret subscribing to Scotese's web, his, his YouTube channel. Now, this is on one of the videos on his YouTube channel, and it's an interview with him in 1993. I had just moved to Ellensburg at that time. This is before the Internet. He's doing this back then. This isn't a guy who just started making paleogeographic global animations last year. He's spent most of his career doing this. Uh, he taught for a long time at the University of Texas Arlington. Yes, and retired a few years ago. I think he's now based out of Northwestern. I just sent him an email, but I haven't heard back. Um, here's a four-minute video, Christopher Scotese describing his process. Actually, some of you said, why don't I put the... Can I pull this out of my pants? Can I pull this out of my pants? Interesting. Okay. So let me crank the volume, max there, and then I'll try to hold this next to... I don't even know where the sound's coming out. In many respects, geologists are, are time travelers, because uh, what we try to do is imagine what the world looked like back then, and uh, by reconstructing environments and understanding the rock record, uh, 
So all I've really done is use computer technology to, to build a, a virtual time machine to allow us to travel back in time and see what, imagine a little bit better what it was like. Ah, old school. Like a television In program, for God's sake. Journal, Dr. Christopher Scotese discusses paleomap reconstructions with regional examples. Dr. Scotese is associate professor of geology at the University of Texas at Arlington. He is chairman of both the paleomap and the Pangaea project. All right, get to His it. His previous positions include senior research geologist at Shell Development Company and research associate at the Institute for Geophysics, University of Texas at Austin. This is Dr. so Scotese dated. Has published numerous papers on paleogeography and plate tectonic reconstructions, and has developed plate tectonic modeling software. Welcome to the research lab, the PaleoMap Project, at the Department of Geology, University of Texas at Arlington. In this video journal, we will be discussing some of the results of the PaleoMap Project, describing the interactive computer graphic techniques we use, and reviewing some of the digital data sets we have assembled as part of our research. An example of the results of this project is a wall chart published by AAPG illustrating the changing distribution of continents and ocean basins during the past 600 million years. On each map, land areas are illustrated in green, mountain areas are shown in red, and the changing width of shallow seas are shown in light blue. Though maps are a good way to show changing paleogeography, the Earth is a dynamic planet. The best way to show these dynamics is through computer animation. In the latter part of this video journal, we will review a new computer animation that illustrates the changing distribution of the Earth's continents and ocean basins. Let's start off by looking at a brief part of this animation. Couple more in this minutes. In brief segment of the paleo map reconstruction, we start with the Earth's plates in their present locations. As we view the video backwards in time, we observe the changing positions of the continents and plates over millions of years. Here we see the closing of the Atlantic Ocean and the union of the American and African plates. <laughs> I love the music. <laughs> now, plate tectonics uh, has been around for 30 years, and it's taken about 20 years for the sorts of data to accumulate for us to be able to make maps of the past. Everyone is familiar with uh, present-day plate boundaries, and let me just bring some of those up. What's shown on the globe is uh, present-day coastlines in green, the edge of the continent in light blue, and certain tectonic boundaries. In this case, modern plate boundaries are shown in yellow, major strikes of faults in red, and throughout much of Asia, purple lines, which represent zones of closure between continents where ancient oceans were consumed, uh, resulting in uh, sutures. All right. You can watch the rest of that. An interesting analogy can be made. Uh, what we do is, in many respects, like... There's one more minute, but I, I want to move on. So that was, what, almost 30 years ago, right? So this one came out from Christopher's lab uh, six months ago. No, May of 2019. And he's come a long way. I'll put my... I don't think I need sound for this. I think he's got some classical music, but not that important. It's nice, but not that important. So what I want to show you, this is less than two minutes long. He's going to start us 540 million years ago, the Cambrian, when the trilobites are in Sharon's backyard in Colville. And I'll try to, mm, is this the one he has Chicago on it? I'll try to help you find North America, and we're just going to track the western margin of North America through the magic window time. Let's just try it. All right, North America, western edge of North America. Dates are up here in the upper left. This is going to go fast now. He's going to go from the beginning of the Paleozoic still passive margin for us. 390 was the end of our passive margin right now. Now we're in the northern hemisphere or at least straddling the equator. Pangaea begins Pangaea begins now. 
Ice Age, come and gone. Still Pangea. Pangea about to end. Start splitting North America away from Europe and Africa and begin the days of terrain accretion. We're in the magic window for exotic terrains right now. We're still in the magic window for our class, but we're approaching 50 million years ago. We're done with exotic terrains, and in the last 30 million years, we're gonna do basin and range extension, clockwise rotation, and the San Andreas Fault. Bad news bears, exactly. All right, one more. This is the newest uh, of Scotese's animations. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on? Uh, this is six minutes long. I don't think we'll look at the whole thing. But it's dual hemisphere. He's got both sides of the planet viewable at all times. And he's got a time scale along the bottom. And I think, well, does this start also 500? Yeah. So this is the same time frame, but um, we'll just play it. I don't know. We'll just play it for a little while. This came out in winter, uh, seven months ago, not nine months ago, November, last Thanksgiving. Here we go. Oh, shit. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got to figure out who we are, where we are. That's us. That's us. That's us. That's us. Got it. North America, right here. Passive margin on our north coast. So the west coast, like Idaho shoreline, Sharon's backyard, over here. Obviously a lot to soak in here, so I'll let you play with these on your own. Soothing music makes me think of ordinary people. Timothy Hutton, Mary Tyler Moore, Donald Sutherland. Filmed when I was in high school. Okay. Did I want to? Sure, let's, let's, let's go to our magic window. So I've skipped ahead to our magic window for this fall, which is 200 to 50, right? 200 to 50 million years ago. We'll obviously come back to this, but here's the western edge, western edge of North America. Magic window begins now. Terrains. Haven't really split yet from Africa. Now we begin. Active margin, passive margin. We're in the Cretaceous. Dinosaurs. Okay. We'll use that a lot. Thank you to Christopher Scotese for his excellent work over the years. That's the end of the cozy four. No, it isn't. One more. What's been going on since 50 million years ago? Mostly this.
That's Bob Butler narrating. Want to see it again? It's an animation of the clockwise rotation, also the base and the range extension. Okay, so it's a good time, I think, to not only answer a few questions about today, but maybe get people up to speed if you're feeling like this is starting to slip away from you and you don't have some of the basics yet. And remember, I am also feeling like I want to experiment. We got more than 850 people. I'm going to see if I have a signal way over there. And I got a beer waiting for me as well. Nick, I got to say, I just, I do not approve of you drinking alcoholic beverages on a live stream. Nick, there are children watching. I am deeply offended. By your behavior. Cell phone live streaming on a ladder, moving the ladder. Are we functional? I'm going to be pretty pumped if I can be this far away from the house and we're functional. Next time, if we are, next time I see Townie Steve, I'm going to kiss him on the cheek. What? Give me a second. Ten minutes after the hour. All right, not that bad, I guess. Let's pop out. I'm glad you're still with us. Um, popping out the live chat like a boss. Right between the eyes. We're going to do some between the eyes Sunday. If you're not sure where that came from. We still good? Oh no, am I not good? Wait, what am I? Oh, I got, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got to get on this power channel with my wireless because we're still good. Oh, we're buffering? No. It is? Ah. All right, I got greedy. I got greedy. All right, we'll try it again in a second, but I don't, I don't want to waste your time. Um, I'm right here by the house, and my laptop's back over there, but let me just answer a few questions here, and then we'll, we'll try it again by going back over there. It's just an experiment. So would you mind typing in an uppercase your question, and I'll just try to grab it here in real time. I'm getting mixed results now, or mixed reports on the, on the buffering. What questions do you have about today or anything we've done so far? Steve, so are the terrains in our magic window a result of the Proto-Pacific Ocean spreading? Steve, thanks for the question. Um, generally, yes, but I'll tell you what, Steve. Uh, I'm pretty sure that for the next few weeks, I'm going to only be visiting terrains and collecting data. And I'm going to try not to do a bunch of tectonic modeling because that's where the confusion is. There's lots of different ideas for how these terrains got to us. And so we'll eventually talk about changing situations in the Pacific, but I'm going to ask you to be patient on that. Why is Pendleton in the middle of the center of the rotation? Fluffy. Um, basically, you're far enough inland uh, as 
I understand that the uh, clockwise rotation is a direct result of the two ocean plates doing their thing, the Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific plate. And by the time you get away from the ocean to Pendleton, you've lost that influence of major clockwise rotation. Tuligan doesn't see Baja BC on the animations. You're right. Baja BC is still a minority opinion among many. We'll get into it. When did Australia split from North America? 750 million years ago. That was the lesson from last time. Why not use magnetic surveys to, of orientations to find the old edge of North America? Donna, magnetic surveys. There's been a lot of different ways to find the old edge of North America, including seismic profiles, tomology, strontium chemistry. We had that discussion a couple of sessions ago. It's the best I've got for you. Uh, functional, though blurry, probably due to the weather on my end, that beer you're drinking. Do I dare go back over there and see if, we're, if this is still working? I think I'm going to try it. We'll do a few more. I'll, I'll try to walk slowly because I know, I know if I move quickly, there's a problem. So you're part of an experiment. I hope you're not annoyed by that. So you're back to Larry. You're wireless. You're not, I mean, so you're on a, a wireless. You're not on data. And I'm just going to look at your comments here. Can you give me a 5x5 five five or not? Paper's all over the place now. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Perfect, five by five, cured, 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 five by five. Okay, great, well, let's just assume we're good. Uh, am I the same thing here? Yeah, I'm live here too. Okay, good, well, let's, let's try it. More questions? Uh, we'll go another five, 10 minutes because I've, I've kind of wasted your time on this. Uh, I do have pants on. What kind of beer? Um, this is the last of the Icicle Brewing Company's German Chocolate Cake Ale. Geology questions? Uh, Patrick, age seven, is Horst and Graben the same as Basin and Range? More or less, Patrick, but the Horst and Graben model is no longer as accurate as we think it was once upon a time. And I talked about that a while back in spring, if you remember. Instead of it's a half Graben model, where the blocks are rotating as opposed to just blocks going up and down. Thank you for be with, being with us, Patrick. What do I find most fascinating about these exotic terrains? Marcin, that's coming. Um, there's lots of things to really be excited by, and I appreciate everyone's patience before we get there. I hope you can see the value in these pre-sessions to get our mind ready uh, for the timing and also today trying to get some of that coastline restored uh, to the right position. How do we know the passive margin is the coastline, says Price? Interesting question. In addition to the limestones and the shales and the sandstones, There are fossils of things that are only found at the beach or in a tidal lagoon or immediately offshore. Things like stromatolites, things like ripple marks, things like um, basically beach systems that are preserved in the rock. So you're right, there are limestones and shales and sandstones that are not at the beach. Uh, but we have enough evidence from the paleontology community and the sedimentology community to know that we were at uh, the margin of the continent back at that time. Reading more questions before we quit. Uh, is that Nevada spreading, breaking up the craton? 
Interesting question. I guess it is successful in breaking up the craton in eastern Nevada and western Utah. I've never really thought about that before. Yeah, I think it is. That's a short answer, but I think it is. Okay, did the passive mind ever become an active margin? If so, when? Yeah, that's where we pick up our story a week from today. 390 million years ago, our western margin. Now, you know when I say western margin, right? It wasn't really the western margin. It was the northern margin through much of Christopher's animations. But again, I can't do that in my head every time. So we're just going to view North America, quote unquote, the right way, up and down. You know what I mean? But yes, 390 million years ago, which was on our whiteboard as the end of the passive margin, it becomes active. It becomes a convergent boundary. And we'll start looking at that evidence a week from today. Why a week from today? Why not next time? Well, next time we're going to do some basics on strike slip faulting. And we'll see how much the terrain fruitcake has been offset by younger than 50 million year old strike slip faults. There, I just gave you the plan for Sunday morning. Kathy in Brisbane, is basin and range extension due to cessation of subduction story or clockwise rotation or both? There's still some different opinions, Kathy, on why that extension is happening. Everybody agrees there's hot mantle coming to the surface underneath Nevada. Some think it's tied to the East Pacific rise, slipping beneath North America, and others think it's more tied to the clockwise rotation as you basically actively rotate California away from the Rocky Mountains and the Basin and Range extension is happening kind of in the wake of that rotation. A couple more. Is the Basin Range complex the place where you can find craters of the moon? Got me. Yes, I wish we could view the continents correctly, always using north-south confusing. Well, Corey Sue, um, I, I take your point, but aren't we so used to reading maps north and south? I can speak for myself. I can't do that. I can't. I can't spend all of our time. Uh, talking about our coastline being north, east, south, west, and then having stuff come in. Because we'll keep comparing to these places which we are most conveniently viewing in our north-south orientation. So I think you're better than I am in that respect. Three more and we're done. It's 20 minutes after the hour already. Fruit cake in relation to the German chocolate cake? Okay, well, those are my two cake analogies that I've used so far. The fruit cake, as you'll see on Sunday, is the main analogy we'll use for exotic terrain basement, and you'll see why on Sunday. And then a majority of the fruit cake is covered in German chocolate cake, which erupted 16 million years ago. So we only have a few precious places to see the fruitcake directly, to see those, those little nuts and the dates and the other stuff that's in there. And I will be cutting into the fruitcake and Derek's fruitcake on Sunday. Is the Nevada Basin and Range connected in any way to the failed northern mid-continent rift? I don't think so. The mid-continent rift, all I know about it is it's back uh, in Duluth, Minnesota, stretching down through the upper Midwest, and it was active 1.1 billion years ago. That's a lot, lot, lot older than the initiation of the basin and range extension 30 million years ago. But you might know about the, more about the mid-continent rift than I do. Two more. Am I down to present day? Is the basin and range a failed rift? No, it's still active. Some of the earthquakes we had this spring during the live streams were from Nevada and western Utah and even central Idaho. That's all tied to normal faults of the basin and range. So it's still rifting. It may fail at some point, but it's not a failed rift now for sure. 
Two more. Yeah, are we still okay? One last check with you. I'm this far away. I'm getting excited where I might actually live stream from here, right next to the frogs. And I, I like it because I, I have more direct sunlight, even though it's tough to squint in. So, yeah, we're five by five. Ah, Townie Steve, you son of a gun. Looking for one to end on here. We'll end with J.L. Cop. Is the old North American coast visible anywhere near Boise? No. And that's the heck of it. At Boise, we have Young Snake River Plain, Western Snake River Plain, Graben, Patrick, sediments, lavas that are younger than the Columbia River basalts. There's so much of this old North America story that just is unavailable to us. And that's one of the main reasons I was spending so much time setting the table, quote unquote. So with our sketches that we had, it looks like our coastline is plain as day all the way through. And the passive margin sediments are all just as flat and well behaved as you'd like. Well, it turns out most of that is either buried or invaded from below. And new information most of the passive margin isn't flat anymore. Think of how much action there's been in the last 500 million years. Think of how much faulting, how much folding. And we'll get into that as time goes on. A toast to you. And let me grab the clipboard. Thank you for joining us today in our discussion called Paleogeography, trying to restore the old coastline of North America, restoring the passive margin by taking out the basin and range extension and the clockwise rotation. There's one more thing to take out, by the way, and that is the amazing amount of strike-slip faulting and offsetting of major chunks of real estate here in the American West. And we will learn about strike-slip faulting. We will remove the strike-slip faulting on Sunday morning. And I think if the weather's cooperative, we'll take a little bike ride on Sunday morning as well to celebrate the end of our table setting and to rejoice in the fact that our visitors are almost here. The exotic terrains are almost here. When's the next live stream? Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific. Here's to you for continuing to show up with an open mind, with an inquisitive mind, and ready to learn a few new things each time we get together. Here's to the health of your family and friends, near and far. And here's to all the workers around the world in various capacities, in various lines of employment, trying to keep us all going on a large scale and on a small scale. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks to Townie Steve for allowing me to live stream, what, 20 yards away from the router? I'm thrilled and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do this again Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Goodbye, be well, enjoy the weekend. We'll see you Sunday morning, 9 a.m. I love you. Goodbye.